Day in and day out, the PBYs would lift their overladen airframes into the air to begin the long haul out to the maximum point of their ocean sweep. However, it was only on the 3rd of June, the date identified by Hypo as the earliest feasible for the start of the Japanese offensive, that the imminence of a Japanese invasion of Midway was finally revealed to the air crews. With the search pattern of the PBYs now covering all likely approaches to Midway, it was only a matter of time before the rapidly closing Japanese forces were seen, and the curtain arose on one of the most decisive battles in the history of warfare. The first act in the great drama now unfolding opened many hundreds of miles from Midway Island when, shortly after three, the carriers Ryujo and Junyo launched their aircraft to attack Dutch Harbour and thus initiate the combat phase of Operation AL. However, owing to the prevalence of the fog and generally bad weather so characteristic of the region, Junyo's attack force of 15 Val dive bombers and 13 escorting Zeros was unable to locate the target and returned to the carrier. Ryujo's airgroup had better luck, and nine of her Kate bombers and three of her Zeros found a break in the cloud which revealed their target directly below them at about 8.08. Radar aboard a seaplane tender in the harbour detected the incoming Japanese strike group, and although the vessels in the harbour could not make their escape, the anti-aircraft defences were forewarned and were able to put up a heavy barrage. The Zeros also tangled with a number of P-40S that managed to get aloft. Although damage was inflicted on the base, another raid scheduled for 945 to attack the naval vessels in the harbour was launched. The inclement weather hid the target, forcing the aircraft to return to their carriers, but not before they had tangled with some United States fighters in the process, losing a Zero fighter. At midday, with the aircraft recovered, Admiral Kakuta turned his force to the southwest. Two days later, another strike was made on Dutch Harbour, which completed the destruction of the oil farm and further damaged other installations. The Army Air Force responded by launching raids by B-17s and B-26s, but they achieved no hits on the Japanese vessels. By the time his aeroplanes were landing, Kakuta had been told by Yamamoto that, because of events in the Midway battle, Operation AL was suspended, and he and his carriers were to stand by for action to the south. Although the invasion of Adak was cancelled, Atu and Kiska were occupied on 5 and the 7th of June as planned. Nevertheless, the whole AL operation was a pointless exercise, failing totally in its aim. Admiral Nimitz was never in doubt that the attack on the Aleutians was anything more than a diversionary sideshow, and in terms of the wider battle about to begin, that is what it remained. Some hours after the first attack on Dutch Harbour, sightings by PBYs on air patrol far to the southwest of Midway Island were to herald the start of the main battle. The first contact with the approaching Japanese forces was made by PBY No. 6 V-55, whose pilot, Ensign Charles Eaton, reported the sighting of two cargo vessels at 9.04. But it was the broadcast some 21 minutes later from another PBY flown by Ensign Jack Reed that electrified the Midway garrison. At the extreme limit of their PBY's patrol search, the crew of 8 V-55 had spotted a group of ships on the horizon, this prompted Reed to dispatch the message sighted main body, followed a few minutes later by bearing 262, distance 700 miles. Demanding greater clarification of the sighting, for they were not prepared to release their air assets on the strength of such vague reports, Shannon and Simard then had to wait some hours before they received from the PBY pilot the detailed information they desired. Hampered by clear skies devoid of any protective cloud cover, Ensign Reed had to change course and altitude frequently to avoid detection and secure the most efficacious position, whereby he could obtain accurate information on the makeup of the Japanese force. Approaching from astern, he saw laid out before him Rear Admiral Tanaka's midway invasion force, cruising at a stately 19 knots with the light cruiser Jintsu steaming between and at the head of two parallel columns of transport vessels. To their four in an arc ploughed the ten screening destroyers. The report he now filed was received on Midway at 11.25, and in it Reed counted 11 vessels, identifying them as a small carrier, one seaplane carrier, two battleships, several cruisers and several destroyers. The variety of warship types suggests that Reed's report was, unbeknown to himself, based upon a composite sighting.
In all probability, this resulted from his frequent manoeuvring in the intervening hours since his initial message to Midway, in the process of which he not only espied Tanaka's invasion force, but also flew across the track of Kondo's main body, Kurita's close support force and Fujita's seaplane tender group, all of which were operating in close proximity to one another. Despite Reed's inaccurate identification of some of the vessels in Tanaka's convoy, it was clear that a sizable Japanese force was now heading on a direct course for Midway. This knowledge allowed Simard to give the green light to release the army pilots for an airstrike. As Reed's PBY turned for home and disappeared over the horizon, a message from Jintsu had already flashed through the ether, breaking the blanket Japanese radio silence and conveying the news to the flagship that the invasion force had been discovered by American aircraft 600 miles from Midway. Up to this point, all was seen to be going well, and accounts indicate that the commander-in-chief and his staff aboard Yamato were all in fine fettle. Tanaka's broadcast, however, put an immediate dampener on proceedings with the realisation that the enemy had established contact with the advancing fleet much earlier than the operational plan had allowed for. As matters now stood, the commander-in-chief and his staff could only reconcile themselves to the premature initiation of combat and the inevitability of early air attacks on Tanaka's invasion force. Of the aircraft on Midway, only the Army B-17s had the range to mount an effective attack on the Japanese force at this distance. Even so, it had been necessary to fit an extra fuel tank in each of their bomb bays, reducing the actual offensive load carried by half to just four 500-pound explosives apiece. Shortly after 12.25-9, flying fortresses under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Walter Sweeney took off, heading westwards in the general direction of Reed's last sighting fix. It was 1640 before they located the Japanese force and began their high-level heavy shelling runs. Far below, Jintsu and her ten screening destroyers opened up at the rapidly moving shapes above them with their anti-aircraft batteries, but the effectiveness of their fire was more apparent than real, for none of the B-17s was hit. In turn, the American bombers failed to hit any of the Japanese ships, although the great waterspouts raised close to a number of the vessels prompted some totally unjustified claims by the pilots on return to Midway. In their debriefings, pilots and crews spoke of hits on six vessels, including two transports, two heavy cruisers, and even two battleships. On the presumption that these vessels were now flame-racked hulks, the submarine United States ship Cuttlefish, which was patrolling in the vicinity, was sent to sink them. Not surprisingly, it was unable to find any trace of the purported wrecks. Very early the following morning, Tanaka's as yet unscathed force was subjected to another, smaller but more successful air attack. Four of the lumbering and vulnerable PBYs had been jury-rigged to carry single torpedoes, and with volunteer crews had taken off from Midway at 21.15 late on the 3rd of June with the intention of attacking the Japanese force. Three reached the convoy, fixing its position with their onboard radar, and by taking advantage of the bright moonlight which silhouetted the enemy vessels, began their attack at 1.30. Only the PBY flown by Ensign Probst registered a hit, his torpedo detonating close to the bow of the oiler Akabono Maru, the explosion put to death 11 of her crew and wounded a further 13, but the damage to the vessel was successfully contained, and she was soon able to reposition herself in the convoy. The PBYs succeeded in escaping the hail of anti-aircraft fire sent aloft by the Japanese vessels, and proceeded in their slow, plodding fashion to head back to Midway. They arrived back just as the air attack by Nagumo's strike force was beginning. The tone on board the Enterprise and Hornet had been set the previous day, when Spruance signalled to the vessels of his task force the essence of the plan formulated to deal with the expected Japanese carrier force heading for Midway. A remarkably dispassionate affair, it nevertheless conveyed in its matter-of-factness a subdued confidence. Somewhat later on the same day, the planned and vital rendezvous at Point Luck took place, with Fletcher officially taking over tactical command of both carrier groups, although in practice the two task forces were to operate independently. Radio silence was absolute, even the use of the intership communication system, which was believed to be secure from signal leakage, being suspended. The 3rd of June saw the three carriers and their escorts ploughing a zigzag course in and around the vicinity of Point Luck, 
with Fletcher and Spruance patiently waiting for Nagumo's carriers to show their hand. The day had not been without its drama, however. Both Nimitz and Fletcher had been party to the news of Ensign Reed's discovery of Tanaka's invasion force in the early morning, and the possibility had always existed that his description of the enemy force as the main body would be accepted by one or either of them as just that. Nimitz, however, saw nothing, even in the more detailed reports received later in the morning regarding the makeup of the enemy force, to make him doubt the intelligence advice given to him by Hypo that the main Japanese striking force lay in Nagumo's carriers and that they had yet to make their appearance. Fletcher had also reached this conclusion, receiving confirmation from Nimitz late that afternoon in a coded message flashed to the Yorktown. That is not repeat, not the enemy striking force. Stop. That is the landing force. The striking force will hit from the northwest at daylight tomorrow. With the clock now beginning to run ever faster, Fletcher ordered that Enterprise and Hornet be flashed a course change, and at 19.50 the two task forces headed south through the night, aiming for a point approximately 200 miles north of Midway. Assuming that Nagumo would turn up as predicted by intelligence, it was from here that Fletcher intended to launch his aeroplanes against the Japanese carriers early on the following day. The 3rd of June was a day of frantic preparations aboard the four carriers of the first air fleet. Final refuelling had been completed, and shortly after six, the five oilers of the supply train and their escorting destroyer, the Akigumo, fell away. The carriers and their escorts then turned to the southeast and accelerated to 24 knots to begin the final run-in towards Midway. Deep in the bowels of the carriers, mechanics laboured long and hard on the engines of the aircraft to ensure optimum performance, while the armourers loaded belts of bullets and shells into the machine guns and cannon. Others made ready the bombs and their shackles in preparation for the attack scheduled for the early hours of the following morning. From the bridge of the flagship, Admiral Nagumo observed the scene about him. A tight defensive ring had been formed around the four carriers by the fast battleships Haruna and Kirishima, along with the heavy cruisers Tone and Chikuma, the light cruiser Nagara and the twelve destroyers of the screening force. Symptomatic, perhaps, of the rise in tension was a false sighting of enemy aircraft in the early evening by the watch on the zone, and although three zeros were launched from the Akagi to investigate, nothing was found. Down below, the pilots detailed for the midway strike relaxed or slept as the mood took them, while others, perhaps more mindful of their own mortality, took time to visit one of the small Shinto shrines on board, invoking the protection of its kami in the trial to come. All through the fleet, there was the growing awareness that in a matter of hours the enemy would be engaged, in the greatest battle ever fought by the combined fleet. From the lowliest sailor to the most senior officer, there exuded the almost tangible expectation of certain victory in the hours and days ahead. In the hours before 2.45, at which time the aircrew were awoken aboard Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu and Soryu, until 4.30, when the first aircraft of the Midway Attack Group were launched, the carriers of the first air fleet were hives of intense activity. The regular and persistent metallic clang and associated hum of hydraulic lines reverberated through the carriers as lifts raised the fully fueled and armed aeroplanes of the first strike wave from the hangar levels below to the flight deck. The whole process of physically manhandling and spotting aircraft in their correct positions on the flight deck was tiring but exacting work. First came the large Kate level bombers, which were positioned at the rear of the flight line, followed in their turn by the dive bombers. The last to be placed were the Zero Sen fighters, which would be the first to launch, providing the protective umbrella below which their heavier brethren would seek safety. At three, engines spluttered, then roared into life as mechanics began to warm them up. Below decks, pilots of the first strike wave donned flying suits before moving through the narrow passageways to the galleys, where breakfast preceded a final briefing. Many were in a state of nervous but excited anticipation, as this was their first combat mission. The employment of the younger replacement pilots in the first attack wave was a deliberate ploy by Nagumo. He was retaining the majority of his veteran flyers aboard the carriers to form a second strike force, and thus ensure against the possibility of American carriers making an appearance. While this was symptomatic of his natural caution, even Nagumo had no real reason at this stage to suppose that such an eventuality was likely. He perceived the intelligence picture as altogether quite rosy, 
Having been denied any knowledge of the premature discovery of Tanaka's invasion force on the previous day by Yamamoto's continuing insistence on radio silence, he had no reason to believe that the anticipated element of surprise, deemed so important for this stage of the operation, would not be achieved. Such optimism is implicit in the intelligence appraisal that he circulated to senior commanders shortly before operations commenced. 1. The enemy fleet will probably come to engage when the Midway landing operations are begun. 2. Enemy air patrols from Midway will be heavier to westward and southward, less heavy to the north and northwest. 3. The radius of enemy air patrols is estimated to be approximately 500 miles. 4. The enemy is not yet aware of our plan, and he has not yet detected our task force. 5. There is no evidence of an enemy task force in our vicinity. 6. It is possible for us to attack Midway, destroy the land-based planes there, and support landing operations. We can then turn around, meet an approaching enemy task force, and destroy it. 7. Possible counterattacks by enemy land-based aircraft can surely be repulsed by our interceptors and anti-aircraft fire. Apart from point 7, which was shortly to receive dramatic verification, the other observations were hopelessly in error. Such self-deception goes far to explain the tardiness with which the Japanese now approached the whole matter of aerial reconnaissance, on which the security of the carrier force turned. Mitsuo Fuchida, the designated first strike leader until illness rendered him hors de combat shortly after leaving Japan, observed that provision for reconnaissance was made on the basis of a single-phase search, the aeroplanes being dispatched only after the launch of the Midway strike force. Assuming that all went according to plan, any American force within the search arc would be located and dealt with by Nagumo's second strike wave. Whilst believing the single-phase search plan adequate, he harboured doubts concerning its efficacy as a result of difficulties experienced in its employment during the Indian Ocean operation, when enemy surface vessels had been spotted only after air groups from the carriers were already attacking other targets. The limitation of the single-phase search was that it was sufficient only to confirm as he somewhat pithily observed what the Japanese already believed, that there was no American force in the area. This failure to instigate a more thorough search procedure, which would of necessity have required the employment of far more aircraft than the few allotted, also stemmed from a great reluctance to employ combat aircraft such as the Kate and Val, which possessed the necessary range for such tasks, at the expense of strapping a bomb or torpedo underneath them, and using them for offensive purposes. There can be no doubting the impact of inadequate reconnaissance methods on Japanese fortunes in the battle about to commence. Minoru Gender, air officer of the air fleet, reflecting after the battle, admitted that the search plan was negligent, and that in consequence it proved to be the initial cause for the midway defeat. Having received their final briefing, the aircrew on the four carriers emerged onto their respective decks and proceeded to board their aircraft. Engines were turned over and sprang into life as the 108 aircraft of the first wave warmed up for takeoff. With their flight decks illuminated by floodlights, all four carriers turned into the wind. From their respective bridges, green lights flashed on, and as the roar of the engines rose to a crescendo, the first of 36 Zero fighters, led by Lieutenant Masuharu Suginami from the Soryu, launched promptly at 4.30. Against a backdrop of cheering deckhands and waving white caps, 36 Val dive bombers launched from Akagi and Kaga, with 36 Kate level bombers from Soryu and Hiryu, under the respective commands of Lieutenant Shoichi Ogawa and raid leader Lieutenant Joicho Tomonaga. One by one, the aircraft took up station amid the huge formation circling the fleet. Fifteen minutes after launching had started, Tomonaga gave the order and all 108 aircraft of the first strike wave turned to the southeast and headed towards Midway. No sooner had they departed that the lifts on the carriers were delivering more aircraft onto the decks. Just nine zeros were sent aloft from Kaga to provide a combat air patrol for the 21 vessels of the fleet, with another nine spotted on Akagi's flight deck as a contingency reserve. This was hardly a sufficient strength to suggest expectation of enemy attack, and was no doubt symptomatic of the general air of confidence pervading the fleet. The next air elements launched comprised the reconnaissance types, all of which were due to take off promptly at 4.30. Haruna's floatplane catapulted as planned, 
Kaga and Akagi launched their D3 AIs to begin their air searches to the south and southeast of Midway itself. However, the two Mitsubishi Pete floatplanes of the heavy cruiser Chikuma did not get aloft until five and eight minutes past the due launch time. Even more unfortunate for the Japanese was the delay on her sister ship, Zone. While one of her floatplanes was catapulted off at 4.42, the second was not finally sent aloft until 5, some 30 minutes after the planned launch time. Whatever the subsequent explanations offered for these delays, and they ranged from troublesome engines and catapults to simple sloppiness of procedure, the consequences of those lost minutes were very shortly to prove fatal to the fortunes of the first air fleet. Following Reveille at 3, Midway rapidly became a scene of purposeful activity as the many aircraft squeezed onto the small island base were prepared for the decisive events of the coming day. Half an hour before the Japanese strike wave took off from their carriers, 11 of the amphibious PBYs lumbered down the runway, hauling their overloaded and inelegant airframes into the air and out over the wide expanse of the Pacific to begin the search that would surely provide, before the morning was much older, the first sightings of Nagumo's carriers. Shortly thereafter, against the backdrop of dawn's early light, Lieutenant Colonel Sweeney's force of 16 Army B-17s was once more sent aloft to visit further destruction on Tanaka's invasion force, still ploughing its slow course towards midway. With the big boys now departed, the rest of the aircraft spread across the base were armed with bombs and torpedoes and made ready for action. Engines were started and given their preliminary warm-up, their pulsating throb reverberating through the cool of the early morning air. On both islands of the Atoll base, Marines called to their weapons, checked their ammunition and practised last-minute gunnery drill, elevating and rotating their pieces while tensely awaiting the first radar sighting of the incoming enemy. Although the two sets on the base were somewhat dated, their maximum detection range of 150 miles gave valuable early warning time. There would be no catching aircraft on the ground this time, as at Pearl Harbor. Events now began to move quickly. Between 5.20 and 5.53, a series of sightings from PBYs and on the ground, radar galvanised the whole base into frenetic activity. The initial sighting was relayed by a PBY of Flight 58, commanded by Lieutenant Howard P. Addy at 5.20. He reported spotting a Japanese reconnaissance aeroplane. At 5.30 came the words that those on Midway, in Fletcher's task force and on Oahu, had been waiting so tensely to hear. Carrier bearing 320, distance 180. The order now went out to the pilots to man their aircraft. By 5.45 all were ready, with engines turning over, awaiting the word to launch. Some minutes later a further flash was received from a second PBY, flying a pattern adjacent to that of Flight 58. It stated that many aeroplanes were heading towards Midway on a bearing of 320 degrees. This provided both Midway and Fletcher with the absolutely vital information that Nagumo had committed his first strike wave, and that it was inbound to the atoll base. In the meantime, life had become decidedly more hazardous for the shadowing PBYs. Far below, keen eyes on the Japanese vessels had spotted one of the Catalinas drifting across the sky and heavy anti-aircraft fire had opened up on the unwelcome observers, littering the sky around them with ugly smudges of black smoke. Zero fighters had launched from cargo in a bid to shoot down the intruders, but by making good use of the cloud cover, the two PBYs successfully avoided them. Finally, at 5.52, Lieutenant Addy was able to dispatch the clinching sighting fix on Nagumo's force, reporting, Two carriers and battleships bearing 320 degrees, distance 180 course 135, speed 25. Barely a minute thereafter, Midway obtained its own radar sighting, when operators poring over their scopes in the shack on Sand Island detected the incoming Japanese strike force at a range of 93 miles and an altitude of 11,000 foot. As they moved ever closer to Midway, the blips rapidly resolved into one large formation, denoting the approach of a sizable enemy force. Without further ado, the order was given to send off the aircraft. As the air raid siren wailed over Midway, the Wildcat and Buffalo fighters of VMF-221 took off and, once aloft, headed for the Japanese formation.
In their wake, the pilots of the bombing aircraft taxied their charges to the runway and prepared in rapid succession to take off before the arrival of the enemy. The first aloft were the dive bombers of VMSB 2416 Marine SBDs, led by Major Lofton Henderson, each armed with a 500-pound explosive, followed by the venerable SB-2U vibrators under the command of Major Benjamin Norris. Thereafter came the six Navy TBFs of VT-6 and the four Army B-26 medium bombers, these two new types making their combat debut. By 6.20, with the enemy force just 22 miles from Midway, the airbase on Eastern Island lay deserted, and its former occupants were heading at their best speed towards the northwest, and the position of the last sighting of the Japanese carriers, in response to the simple but graphic order attack enemy carriers. Set to join this motley collection of types was Sweeney's force of flying fortresses, which was already far out to sea when it received new orders at six, to divert and head for the more significant target of Nagumo's carriers. The somewhat limited chances of survival of this uncoordinated, ill-experienced and poorly equipped force had been further reduced by the decision not to employ the Wildcats and Buffaloes as fighter cover for the bombers. Instead, contrary to Nimitz's original orders, they were to be used to protect the airfield. At 6.16, the 25 Buffaloes and Wildcats under the command of Majors Parks and Armistead acquired their first clear picture of Tomonaga's approaching force. Climbing before the advancing Japanese, Parks was able to secure a height advantage, and with his section of 12 fighters began his diving attack on the level bombers, with Armistead's group in tow. The Zeros, flying top cover, were stationed slightly behind the formation of level and dive bombers, and although they were not initially well placed to respond to the attackers, they were able to use their superior speed and maneuverability to place themselves rapidly on the tails of the slower American fighters. Within a few minutes, a wild and confused swirling melee filled the sky, and it quickly became apparent that the Japanese fighters had the upper hand. The Zeros assailed the buffaloes and wildcats with their machine guns and cannon, hacking them from the air. Nevertheless, the gallant impression made by the marine pilots was enough for one of Soryu's pilots to misidentify the portly and obsolescent buffaloes and report that they had been attacked by 30 to 40 F4F3S at a point some 20 miles from Midway. The Japanese tally for this few minutes of vicious dogfighting was 13 buffaloes and two wildcats shot down, with major parks among the pilots lost. Nagumo was later to record that three level bombers and two zeros were shot down by the marine pilots while inbound to Midway. Emerging from the attack virtually unscathed, Tomonaga led the formation on the final run-in to Midway, although it was frustratingly obvious that the airbase was devoid of aeroplanes. The bulk of the level bombers therefore directed their attention on Sand Island, hits on the oil tanks starting fires that lasted for days. In their wake, Chihaya's dive bombers plummeted down, targeting the hangars and other installations with their 500-pound explosives while the Zeros, now released from their defensive tasks, swooped in at low level, strafing ground targets. The defending fire was of such an order that it was later described by the attackers as a vicious. Official Japanese sources admitted the loss of four aircraft over Midway itself. The captain of the Japanese submarine 1168, which was lying offshore ten miles to the south of Midway, had an excellent view of the raid, and later spoke of the island being turned into a mass of flames with buildings and fuel tanks exploding. Nevertheless, when Tomonaga gave the order for the raiding force to withdraw at 6.43, it was clear to his experienced eye that, in many respects, the raid had not succeeded. United States air power on the island had not been neutralised, and would still be able to use the runways which, most surprisingly, remained undamaged. Neither had the bombing eliminated the bulk of the heavy weapons on the island, nor would these certainly be used to oppose the landing of the invasion force. Tomonaga was some minutes into the return flight before he decided what he thought needed to be done. At seven, he had a message flashed to Nagumo. There is need of a second attack wave. Within moments of receiving his raid leader's signal, Nagumo himself had just reason for believing Tomonaga's request to be sound. Even as Lieutenant Suginami opened the throttle of his Zero and accelerated down the flight deck of the Soryu on the dot of 430, some 220 miles away to the East 10 SBDs from the United States, 
Ship Yorktown were ordered aloft by Admiral Fletcher to scout the Ark of Sea 100 miles to the north of Task Forces 16 and 17. Although he was convinced that intelligence was correct in believing Nagumo would strike at midway from the northwest, in the absence of any firm information he had no intention of allowing the Japanese admiral to catch him with his pants down should he decide to approach the island via a more northerly track. With the last of the scout aeroplanes dispatched, the orderly waiting routine of the past few days was re-established, although it was clear that tension was slowly beginning to build as the minutes ticked away. Aboard Yorktown and Enterprise Fletcher and Spruance sat patiently waiting for news of the first sighting of the Japanese force. When it came, Lieutenant Addy's initial message contained nothing on which the task force commanders could act. However, the message received on Enterprise at 534 not only gave news of the sighting of a carrier, but also contained a vital direction fix on which Spruance could plan his reaction. In principle, it had already been determined. Fletcher and Spruance were in agreement that only an all-out strike on the Japanese carriers, launched at the earliest possible moment, would suffice to yield maximum advantage. This explains Spruance's order to his chief of staff that Enterprise and Hornet be ready to launch everything they had at the earliest possible moment. However, the receipt of later messages citing Nagumo's inbound midway strike force, allied to a second fix on two carriers, placed the Japanese force about 200 miles from the American position and prompted the Admiral to make a rapid reappraisal of the situation. Spruance had originally intended to close to half that distance before launching his airstrike, but it now became clear that by doing so he would forego the opportunity to realise his principal aim of inflicting maximum damage on the Japanese carriers. He estimated that Tomonaga's strike group would recover aboard their respective carriers at about nine, and would then be rearmed for a second strike. They would then be at their most vulnerable to an American air attack. To catch them, Spruance would have to launch very soon, at least two hours earlier than originally intended, even though to reach Nagumo's carriers at that distance involved a round trip that lay beyond the maximum range of his torpedo bombers. It was presumed that Nagumo would have to maintain his present heading to recover his aircraft, and an intercept course was plotted whereby he could be brought within the maximum strike range of 200 miles by about seven. Fletcher also had reason to reflect on the implications of the sightings, governed as he was by his experiences in the Coral Sea. As only two Japanese carriers had been spotted, he decided to hold Yorktown's air group in reserve, pending the receipt of more accurate information locating the other two, or possibly three carriers which intelligence had said Nagumo had in his fleet. Fletcher had no intention of launching all of his aeroplanes, along with those of Enterprise and Hornet, against two carriers, only to find himself totally vulnerable to a massive airstrike from the two or more as yet unlocated enemy flat tops. He also wished to recover the ten scouting aeroplanes sent out earlier. Realising that this would delay action against the two already located enemy carriers, Fletcher flashed Spruance at 6.07 to proceed southwesterly and attack enemy carriers when definitely located. I will follow as soon as my planes are recovered. Turning to their new course, Enterprise and Hornet increased speed to 25 knots and headed towards Nagumo's presumed position in a bid to close the distance before launching. From the hangar levels, the lifts rapidly brought onto their flight decks the SBDs, TBDs and F4Fs, with which the two carrier air groups were shortly to launch their strikes. The two carriers then separated, dividing the screening vessels between them to provide air defence if attacked. Spruance now ordered both carriers turned into the wind, and at seven, Hornet started the launching of the 60 aircraft of her strike group. Under her air group leader, Commander Stanhope C. Ring, were the 15 devastators of VT-8 led by Lieutenant Commander John C. Waldron, known as much for his flying and leadership skill as his somewhat idiosyncratic behaviour. 35 dauntless dive bombers of VB-8 and VS-8, each armed with a 1000-pound explosive in the former unit and a 500-pound explosive in the latter, were provided with an escort of just 10 Wildcat fighters from VF-8, led by the fighter group commander, Lieutenant Commander Samuel G. Mitchell. As Hornet's aircraft assembled, they were joined by those from Enterprise's air group, which commenced launching at 706. The composition of the 61 aircraft group was almost identical to that of Hornet, 
The 14 torpedo bombers of VT-6 were led by Lieutenant Commander Eugene E. Lindsay, and the 37 dauntless dive bombers of VB-8 and VS-8 were commanded by Lieutenants Best and Gallagher. Fighter cover was provided by 10 Wildcats from VF-6 under the command of Lieutenant James S. Gray. Spruance's provision of only 20 Wildcats for fighter cover for such a large striking force was governed by caution in protecting his flat tops. Ever mindful of Nimitz's charge to preserve the carriers, he had retained 36 Wildcats on Enterprise and Hornet as fighter cover in the event of a Japanese counter-strike. In the meantime, having recovered his scouting aeroplanes, Fletcher increased his speed to 25 knots and headed towards Task Force 16. Upon further reflection, he had decided that, although just two carriers had been identified so far, they provided too good an opportunity to miss, so he too would launch. However, he allocated only half of Yorktown's air group to the planned strike, the other half being retained to form a small second strike force. Shortly after 8.30, Yorktown turned into the wind and began launching 17 dauntlesses of VB-3 under the command of Lieutenant Commander Maxwell F. Leslie. These were then joined by the 12 Devastators of 6-3, led by Lieutenant Commander Lance E. Massey, and a minimal force of six Wildcats from Fighting Squadron 3. Thus, by 9-10, Fletcher and Spruance had a total of 156 aircraft airborne and heading for the presumed position of Nagumo's fleet. With the scouting aeroplanes launched, the Japanese carriers were busy once more as the second wave was brought up from the hangar levels and onto the decks. Comprising 108 aircraft, all crewed by battle-proven veterans, the force was under the command of Lieutenant Commander Takashige Igusa of Soryu, regarded by many as the Rengo Kantai's leading exponent of dive bombing. 36 D-3 AI-1S were spotted on the decks of Soryu and Hiryu, while 18 Kates, each loaded with a 24-inch torpedo, were aboard the Akagi and Kaga under the command of Lieutenant Commander Shigeharu Murata. Fighter cover for the whole group was to be provided by 36 Zeros, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Shigeru Itaya, also of Akagi. Although they were provisionally tasked with the role of attacking any American carrier fleet spotted by the scout aircraft, the lack of any reported sightings as the hours rolled by served only to confirm the presumptions of senior officers and aircrew alike that the Americans were not out there at all. It is not surprising, therefore, that when Nagumo received Tomonaga's 0700 signal requesting a second strike on Midway, he pondered its content with a degree of sympathy that, within minutes, hardened to firm assent as the first United States aircraft dispatched from the Atoll base barely an hour before began their attack on the first air fleet. Approaching the Japanese carriers were the four B-26s under the command of Captain James F. Collins and the six TBFs of VT-8 led by Lieutenant Langdon K. Feebling. Lookouts on Akagi were the first to track the incoming hostiles and within minutes her speed increased as the ship and her screening vessels turned to face the attackers, thereby offering them the smallest possible target. Exploding shells and smoke bursts attended the passage of the enemy aeroplanes as the screening destroyers and the heavy cruiser Joan added to the barrage of anti-aircraft fire erupting from Akagi's batteries. Behind this curtain of fire, ten of Itaya's zeros had been sent aloft to join those of the standing air patrol. These rapidly hauled around behind the attackers and soon started wreaking havoc among the incoming aircraft. The TBFs came in first, their speed much reduced owing to the need to open their bomb bay doors to launch their torpedoes. Maintaining course despite the hail of anti-aircraft fire to their front and the attacking zeros to their rear, they managed to loose off several torpedoes mainly directed at Akagi, which was able to avoid them by deft manoeuvring. Of the TBF that flew in low to attack the carriers, five were brought down. Only one escaped to limp back to Midway, its hydraulic system shot up, its controls badly damaged and the rear gunner dead in his turret. The B-26S followed, skimming just above the wave tops with the ever-present Zeros snapping at their heels. One was destroyed on the run, disintegrating into a thousand pieces as it hit the sea at nearly 200 miles per hour. Fuchida clearly recalled seeing another of the bombers, the white star on its fuselage clearly visible, skimming low over the Akagi and barely missing its bridge before bursting into flames and crashing into the sea beyond.
The two remaining marauders, including the one flown by Collins, managed to drop their torpedoes and survived the barrage of fire thrown up by the Japanese vessels to return to Midway. This attack swung the decision for Nagumo. He could hardly retain his second strike force to counter a non-existent threat when a real and very tangible one, in the form of Midway's as yet undestroyed air power, did exist. He snappily ordered that the aeroplanes of the second wave be prepared to attack Midway. That meant a rapid disarming of the Kates on board Akagi and Kaga to replace their torpedoes with bombs. Frantically, the deck crews on the two vessels hauled the aeroplanes to the lifts, from whence they were taken down to the hangar levels. Here, sweating armourers worked as quickly as possible to change the armament so that the aircraft could be returned topside. Even under normal conditions, it took the best part of an hour to carry out this procedure. As Nagumo and his bridge staff were no doubt convinced of the logic of his decision, it must have come no small shock to them when, 25 minutes later, they were presented with a splendidly vague message from Tone's No. 4 floatplane. It read, Sight what appears to be ten enemy surface ships, in position ten degrees distance 240 miles from Midway. Course 150 speed over 20 knots. Minoru Genda observed the fact that imprecision of the sighting left Nagumo and his staff unable to make an accurate judgment of the situation and how best to respond. The Admiral was indeed in a quandary. While his original orders called for the neutralisation of Midway's air power, he clearly could not ignore the potential danger to his own fleet implied by the sighting of these United States naval vessels, whatever their type. Furthermore, the aircraft of Tomonaga's strike group were on their way back to the carriers, and they would need to land, refuel and rearm, even though aircraft of the second wave were still spotted on the carrier decks. Pondering his options, Nagumo signalled his commanders at 7.45 that he had decided to continue preparing for the second strike on Midway, but ordered that those bombers whose armament was as yet unchanged retain their torpedoes, so as to be able to carry out attacks on enemy fleet units. A few minutes later, Akagi signalled the pilot of Tone's No. 4 aircraft with a curt injunction to ascertain ship types and maintain contact. All now turned on the identity of the vessels and the dispatch with which any new sighting was sent to the flagship. If no carrier was detected among them, and they proved only to be surface warships, Nagumo believed he had the time to realise the best of both worlds, launch the second wave against Midway, and then recover the returning first strike force. Once they were refuelled and rearmed, Tomonaga's aeroplanes could be launched again, this time to strike at the American vessels. Barely had the Admiral and his staff finished reflecting on their options when, at 7.48, a signal from Soryu drew their attention to the beginning of yet another air attack on the fleet. The incoming aircraft on this occasion were the 16 Dauntlesses of VMSB-241, but their passage towards the carriers was hampered from an early stage by the dogged attention of a swarm of zeros. Fuchida, watching events from the deck of Akagi, expressed surprise that the aeroplanes were employing a low-angle glide attack and not the hell-diving technique that was their forte. He could not know that Major Lofton Henderson, who was commanding the incoming aircraft, had good reason for choosing this tactic, deeming it to be the only one he could realistically employ because most of the young and very green pilots he was leading had almost no experience at the controls of an SBD. The low-angle approach with dive brakes deployed made them easy targets for the Zeros, and even before they reached the fleet, half of their number had been shot down. Seemingly oblivious to the fate of their comrades, the remainder doggedly held their course even as they flew into the curtain of anti-aircraft fire thrown up by the now rapidly manoeuvring warships. At the end of their glide attacks, the SBDs released their explosives, most of which were targeted at the Hiryu. To observers on the other ships of the fleet, it seemed as if the carrier must be hit as she disappeared behind a wall of water plumes and smoke. Within minutes she emerged, clearly unscathed by the experience. As the eight surviving SBDs made their escape by flying low across the sea, pursued by the fighters, the pressure on the Japanese was relentlessly maintained. High overhead, Lieutenant Colonel Sweeney's flying fortresses swung into view. From 20, 000 foot, the B-17s dropped their loads of 500 pounds explosives on their targets four miles below.
As on the previous day, the dramatic view of bombs bursting close to enemy vessels led the army pilots to claim heavy damage on the Japanese carriers, although none was actually hit. At 8.06, Nagumo received the response he had been awaiting from Tone's number four scout. Its content could hardly have carried better tidings for the harassed admiral. Enemy is composed of five cruisers and five destroyers. Nevertheless, Kusaka, the chief of staff of the first air fleet, was of the opinion that a force so constituted would hardly be at sea unless there was a carrier present. Notwithstanding his eminently reasonable deduction, there can be no doubting the very genuine sense of relief fostered by the 806 message, for as matters now stood, the second strike on Midway could proceed. Even a further attack by Midway-based Marine Vindicators after 8.20 did nothing to dampen the spirits of Nagumo and his staff. They were not to know that with the departure of Major Norris's surviving SB-2 Yus, land-based air power from Midway had shot its bolt. The results of the combat thus far had been totally in favour of the Japanese. From 7.02 until 8.30, they had been attacked by 131 aircraft, with numerous United States aircraft shot down for no registered hits on any vessels of the first air fleet. Fuchida remarked that, in his opinion, the United States flyers had not displayed a high level of ability, a view shared on the bridge of Akagi. The prevailing sentiment was that, if this was the best that the enemy could throw at them, the Japanese had little to fear. Into this self-congratulatory atmosphere on the bridge of Akagi, the latest message from Scout No. 4 dropped like a bombshell on Nagumo and his staff officers at 8.30. The enemy is accompanied by what appears to be a carrier in a position to the rear of the others. All were momentarily shocked at the news, and it could not have come at a worst moment. For accompanying Nagumo's receipt of this message came the first sighting of Tomonaga's returning aeroplanes. Many of the aircraft were low on fuel or damaged, and on arrival over the fleet they began to circle as they awaited permission to land. Unless the decks of the carriers were rapidly cleared of the second strike wave, the returning aircraft would have no alternative but to ditch in the sea. Speed of decision was therefore of the essence. No discussion was needed for the planned second strike on Midway to be aborted. It was self-evident to all on Akagi's bridge that the American carrier now posed the greater danger and must take first priority. Herein lay the dilemma for Nagumo. Of the bombers in the second strike wave, the bulk of the Cates were armed with bombs and not with the more efficacious torpedoes. Should they be launched as armed against the carrier? Certainly Admiral Yamaguchi on Hiryu believed so, and signalled Nagumo to that effect. But Nagumo knew that to launch the strike aircraft immediately would be to do so without benefit of fighter cover. Itaya's Zeros had been aloft since early morning, helping the small number of fighters of the Fleet Combat Air Patrol defeat the repeated United States air attacks. They were also waiting in the circuit to land to refuel and rearm. Nagumo was acutely conscious of the questionable value of sending out the bombers without fighter cover, as they would prove highly vulnerable to interception by enemy fighters, a point well made by the Japanese themselves in the previous few hours. He therefore believed he had sound reasons for supposing that a strike dispatched immediately would prove to be of dubious value, and lead only to the loss of valuable men and machines. Gender and Kusaka were also fully cognizant of these matters and were prompted in consequence to advise Nagumo to recover Tomonaga's force first, and only then attack the carrier. That would require the second strike aircraft at present, spotted on the decks, to be taken down to the hangar levels to clear the decks. While that was being done, the Cates could then also be rearmed with torpedoes. It could not be said that Nagumo suffered from any agony of indecision on this occasion. Less than two minutes elapsed from his receipt of the scout aeroplane's message to the fateful signal flashed to all carriers, instructing that the midway attackers be allowed to land and the second wave strike bombers be rearmed with torpedoes. This was followed at 8.35 by a further signal, ordering that once all aircraft had been recovered, the whole fleet would turn north to contact and destroy the enemy force. As the gongs sounded and orders were barked across the flight decks, there was an intense flurry of activity on all four carriers, as aircraft were manhandled to the lifts and then taken down to the hangar levels. Within minutes they were clear, and at 8.37 the first of Tomonaga's thirsty charges touched down, 
On board, Kaga and Akagi sweating armourers once more lowered explosives from shackles and began the laborious and tiring work of reloading the torpedoes. Owing to the pressure of time and the constant demands of officers to speed up the process, safety procedures were ignored as bombs were casually stacked en masse at the sides of the hangars. To acquire a better fix on the American vessels, more scout aeroplanes were launched at about 8.45, including one of the new D-4Ys from Soryu. Scout aeroplane number four then came back on the air to inform Tone's captain that he was returning to the ship as, having been airborne since five, he was running low on fuel. He was immediately told to postpone and turn on his DF transmitter to allow the carrier fleet to home in on his position. With the last of the midway attackers and Itaya's zeros recovered by 9.17, the whole fleet changed course. A shudder was felt throughout Akagi as speed was increased to 30 knots, and along with the other carriers, the fleet turned to its new heading of east-northeast in a bid to close the distance to the American force. Naguma was confident of being well-placed to launch his first strike, comprising 102 aircraft, against the American carrier by 10.30. The question on everyone's mind was, would they be given the time, or would the Americans strike first? Anxious eyes swept the sky for the airstrike that all aboard had been expecting ever since the American carrier was sighted. Barely three minutes later, keen eyes peering through binoculars aboard Chikuma spotted a collection of black dots on the horizon. They were growing larger by the moment, so there they were. Nevertheless, optimism continued to reign on the bridge of Akagi and throughout the fleet, for all believed that this attack would be weathered as easily as had the others earlier in the morning. But as the American aircraft tracked in towards the fleet, this confidence proceeded to dissipate rapidly. With each sighting it became increasingly apparent to Nagumo and his staff that there were far too many inbound hostiles to have come from just one enemy carrier. Orders were hastily issued to speed up the preparations for launching the airstrike, but it was already too late. The United States Navy flyers had caught the four Japanese carriers at their most vulnerable, and in just the situation that Spruance had hoped for, in the midst of refueling and rearming their aircraft. Unbeknown to Nagumo, the fate of the carriers, their aeroplanes and their pilots was already sealed. The life of the seemingly invincible first carrier strike force had but one hour to run. Spruance had intended to have all the aircraft of Task Force 16's striking force assemble in one large formation before heading off to attack Nagumo's carriers. To that end, the SBDs were launched first, as with their greater range they could afford to circle the task force, burning fuel while the shorter-legged wildcats and devastators took off and joined the formation. But the discovery of Tone's scout aeroplane hovering on the horizon prompted him to change his mind. Fearing that the strike force would lose its element of surprise, Spruance ordered Lieutenant Commander Wade McCluskey, already aloft with his 33 SBDs, to depart immediately leaving the torpedo bombers and fighters to follow. Although McCluskey was thus deprived of any fighter cover, it was clear that the Wildcats would be needed to protect the lumbering and highly vulnerable TBDs. Shortly before eight, McCluskey turned southeast, heading towards the assumed position of Nagumo's force. He was followed by Hornet's dive bombers and fighters and Waldron's VT-8. As the aircraft of Hornet's strike group took their leave, Enterprise's Wildcats were circling the carrier, waiting for the last of the TBDs of VT-6 to take to the air. With their departure, the strike force had become spread out into four distinct bodies, McCluskey's SBDs, Hornet's SBDs and F-4Fs, and the two torpedo bombing squadrons. In addition, the onset of layers of broken cloud made it increasingly difficult for the dive bombers and fighters flying at 19, 000 foot to observe the torpedo bombers, which were holding course just above the wave tops. The Wildcats of VF-6 had been tasked with protecting VT-6, but in the confusion caused by the cloud cover, Lieutenant Gray had unknowingly lost track of VT-6 and ended up flying top cover to Waldron's VT-8. Waldron did not know of the prearranged signal whereby Gray's fighters would descend to aid VT-6, and in consequence both squadrons of torpedo bombers ended up attacking the Japanese carriers devoid of fighter support. At the time of the launch, neither Spruance nor Fletcher had received any update on the position of Nagumo's force since their receipt of Addy's original sighting report.
They were therefore totally unaware of Nagumo's change of course away from Midway and his subsequent run to the north to close with the American carrier group. Thus, Task Force 16's attack force had struck out on a direct route towards the estimated position of Nagumo's carriers, on the erroneous assumption he was still holding his southeasterly course towards Midway. Anticipating that contact would be made with the enemy between 9.15 and 9.39, Hornet's dive bombers and fighters arrived in position only to find themselves over a wide and empty expanse of the Pacific. Choosing to hold this same course, Ring then decided wrongly, as it transpired that Nagumo must have moved even further south towards Midway. Consequently, the SBDs and F-4Fs of Hornet's air group were drawn even further away from Nagumo's actual position. Unable to locate the Japanese fleet and with fuel running low, Ring led some of the SBDs back to the carrier while others landed on Midway. The Wildcats, however, were forced to ditch, as one after another, their fuel tanks ran dry. Following his own hunch, Waldron led his squadron for only part of the way along the identified route before changing course and heading northwest. In his final briefing to his men, he had confided in them that he believed that once Nagumo became aware of the presence of the American carriers, he would change his course and heading. He said that he would do the same, and told his men to follow him as he knew where he was going. Waldron was under no illusions about the prospects of survival for his squadron, but told them that if only one of them survived the run-in, he wanted him to go in and get a hit. Flying his squadron as straight as a die, Waldron found the Japanese fleet exactly where he believed it would be. At 9.20, the 15 devastators of VTI-8 began their lone and self-destructive attack on the enemy fleet. As Nagumo's command accelerated onto its new heading, its vessels deployed to provide maximum defensive coverage for the carriers in the event of air attack. In the van of the advancing fleet, the light cruiser Nagara shepherded the destroyers which screened the advancing fleet to its fore and flanks. To the rear of Nagara, sailing in line ahead, were the fast battleships Kirishima and Haruna, flanked to port and starboard by the carriers Akagi and Hiryu and Kaga and Soryu respectively. The battleships were so placed to bring to bear the firepower of their heavy anti-aircraft batteries in defence of the carriers. The heavy cruisers zone and Chikuma provided flank cover for the inner group of warships and the outermost anti-aircraft screen. No fewer than 50 Zeros were aloft to provide a comprehensive standing air patrol. As soon as Waldron's squadron was spotted at 9.20, the fighters veered off and accelerated towards the incoming torpedo bombers. Waggling his wings, Waldron signalled his squadron to begin their attack. As he was unable to call down Gray's wildcats circling uselessly above him at 20, 000 foot, his attack went in without fighter cover. It seems that he intended to target Akagi, but eight miles out from the fleet, the first of the Zeros swept down on the low-flying squadron and began hacking the TBDs from the air in a hail of machine gun and cannon fire. Within seconds, they had accounted for four of them. As the survivors flew ever nearer, they encountered a wall of anti-aircraft fire that tore apart the airframes and put to death the crews. Fuchida, who was watching from the flagship, recounted how occasionally one of the specks burst into a spark of flame and trailed black smoke as it fell into the water. Although all of TBDs were lost, there was one survivor. Ensign George Gay, who was flying in the last of the Devastators, later recounted how, as he flew through the flak and towards Akagi, he heard his gunner cry out as he was terminated by fire from the Zeros on his tail. Even though he had been wounded by a 20mm cannon shell in his left foot and his aeroplane had been riddled and holed, he managed to release his torpedo. Pulling up over the carrier, he nearly hit its bridge before the fire from the Zeros that were chasing him sent his aircraft crashing into the sea beyond. Gay managed to abandon his sinking devastator and by catching hold of an inflatable life raft, floated free of the wreckage to become an unwitting spectator of the dramatic events of the next few hours. Even as it was announced that all 15 of the torpedo bombers had been shot down, the work of preparing the strike force went on. Amid the violent defensive manoeuvres, aircraft were still being brought up and spotted on deck and having their engines run up. Nagumo now needed a period of relative calm to enable the aeroplanes to be launched, but the gallant sacrifice of 6-8 meant that the carrier fleet had been forced to waste vital minutes in defensive action. This delay was further compounded when it was announced that yet another enemy force had been spotted, 
Inbound to the fleet were Lindsay's 14 Devastators from VT-6. From Akagi it appeared that they were attempting a concerted attack from either bow in single columns. Although their designated fighter cover was still circling high overhead, Lindsay did not give the signal that would have brought Grey's Wildcats plummeting down on the Zeros that were even now tearing into his two columns. As the Devastators bore in towards the fleet, skimming the wave tops, the Japanese fighters began to scythe down the American torpedo bombers. Ripped apart by shellfire, they exploded, disintegrated and fell into the sea. By the time they reached the torpedo release point for Akagi, only seven of the bombers were still airborne. For some reason, these then peeled away from the flagship and headed instead for the Hiryu. Flying through the hail of flak being thrown up by the warships and pursued by the Zeros, the seven surviving aircraft launched their torpedoes at Yamaguchi's carrier. By turning hard to port, the Hiryu succeeded in avoiding them all. As the TBDs pulled away from the fleet, a further three were hacked down, only four managing to return to the Enterprise. Hardly had the Zeros landed to refuel and rearm when, at 10.15, lookouts on the Akagi sighted yet another incoming attack of torpedo bombers. Unlike the previous two attacks, Yorktown's contingent of Massey's 12 Devastators had arrived as part of a coherent strike group. In addition to a small fighter force of six Wildcats under Jimmy Thach, high overhead cruised Leslie's 17 dive bombers. The intention was to launch a combined attack on the Japanese warships in the hope of swamping the defences, thus increasing the chance of at least some of the aircraft getting through. All was going well as the Americans approached the Japanese force. Visibility was good, for when first spotted some 40 miles distant, Nagumo's vessels were seen to be manoeuvring violently, indicating that they were clearly under attack. But as the Yorktown's group deployed for action, the dive bombers flew into heavy cloud, and radio contact was lost with the TBDs and the F-4Fs far below. For Massey and his eleven charges, what now unfolded was nothing more than a replay of the earlier Devastator attacks. The presence of Thark's Wildcats became somewhat academic. So many Zeros were airborne that once the American fighters were embroiled in a dogfight with some of the Japanese aircraft, more than sufficient were left over to attack Massey's torpedo bombers with impunity. Of the twelve devastators that began the run-in, only seven were still in the air some minutes later as they reached their final run-in positions to their targets. Two more, including Massey's, blew up as they ran into the hail of fire thrown up by the ships. The remaining five lunged ahead, splitting their attacks on the Hiryu and Kaga, but in the face of the devastating wall of flak and the omnipresent zeros their torpedoes, once launched, veered wide of their targets. Freed of the weight of their weapons, the surviving TBDs struggled desperately to escape, but two more fell flaming into the sea and another disintegrated as it crossed the outer screen of warships. Only two of VT-3's devastators returned to land forlornly on Enterprise's deck at 10.20. There was a grim sense of satisfaction on the bridge of Akagi as the last of the TBDs staggered away from the carriers. Once again, wave after wave of American torpedo bombers had been thrown at the first air fleet and destroyed with no damage incurred. Now was the moment for the riposte. Without further delay, Nagumo ordered all carriers turned into the wind to make ready for launching. Who could doubt that, with the cream of the Rengo Kantav's pilots about to take off from the decks of the four carriers, Japan was on the verge of realising the decisive victory she so desired. Yet the sacrifice of the 37 American torpedo bombers and their crews had not been in vain. By their repeated attacks, the TBD squadrons had thoroughly disrupted the integrity of the defensive screen around Nagumo's carriers. More significantly, their low-level attacks had pulled down the Zero fighter screen from medium to high altitude, where they normally patrolled, to sea level. This left the skies above the fleet unprotected, and the carriers totally vulnerable to attack from the United States, dive bombers hidden in the clouds above. The engines of the strike group on all four carriers rose to a crescendo as pilots eagerly awaited the signal for takeoff. At almost the same moment as Nagumo gave the order to launch the strike force, a lookout on Kaga made the first sighting of the plummeting United States dive bombers. The time was 10.20. Overhead were McCluskey's and Leslie's SBD squadrons, the former had almost not made it. He had initially proceeded to Nagumo's estimated position, 
but finding nothing there, chose, unlike Ring, to fly north rather than south. As he had already used up half of his fuel, his decision to proceed was brave, for if the Japanese had not been spotted soon, the whole squadron would have had to ditch. Just after ten, McCluskey saw the faint wake of a Japanese destroyer racing to the north. Following the same heading, he was soon rewarded by the sight of three of the carriers under attack. Although Leslie's passage to the fleet had been more direct, it was not without incident. In the process of arming their weapons, faulty electrical circuits caused a number of the SBDs, including Leslie's, to drop their explosives. When both SBD groups finally located the Japanese fleet, Leslie's SBDs approached from the southeast, and McCluskey's came up from the southwest. Their respective approaches gave the pilots differing perspectives of the positions of the enemy carriers, resulting in a dispute that continues to this day regarding whose aeroplanes subsequently hit which carriers. Needless to say, such matters were somewhat academic to those in the Japanese carriers that now became the targets and victims of the United States Helldivers. Only a few desultory bursts of anti-aircraft fire greeted the first of the Dauntlesses as they came hurtling out of the sun. Karga was the first to be struck, the pilots no doubt attracted by her huge size. Four explosives were sufficient to reduce her to a blazing wreck in a matter of minutes. The first three missed her, but the fourth dropped squarely amidst the mass of fully armed and fueled aircraft waiting to take off on the rear of her flight deck. Burning fuel seeped from the deck to the lower levels, filling the passageways and cutting off crew members. Two other bombs hit near the forward elevator, one penetrating to the hangar level where aircraft of the second wave were being fueled and armed. The explosion detonated their fuel tanks and the many 800 kilogram explosives that had been so casually stashed during the first rearming earlier in morning. The eruption of the high octane fuel transformed the hangar level into a conflagration, taking the lives of the mechanics and armourers at work there. The deck became an inferno when the explosion of the fourth explosive generated a shock wave which ruptured a fuel bowser. This then exploded terminating Captain Okada and his command staff on the bridge. Kaga's air officer assumed command, but it was clear that the firefighting teams were conducting a losing battle, for the ship was now blazing from stem to stern. Anti-aircraft guns began firing of their own accord as the ferocious heat set off their magazines. All lights went out as the power failed, and the carrier began to list. For three hours, firefighting teams tried to control the flames that were ravaging what was now little more than a blazing hulk. The ship had become so hot that even the paint had begun to burn on what remained of the superstructure. Although many of the crew had already jumped overboard, Captain Amagai did not give the final order to abandon ship until 1640. By this time, Kaga was alone and forlorn, with just the destroyers Maikaze and Hagikaze picking up survivors. An attack by the United States submarine Nautilus on the Karga, which was mistaken for the Soryu, does not seem to have contributed to her sinking. The end did not come until 1925, when observers saw her hull rent by two massive explosions as the fires reached the magazines. Shortly thereafter, the flaming hulk turned over and sank into the deep, taking with her over 800 of her crew and virtually all of her aircraft.